I first became familiar with some of the technology when I was at Bell Laboratories in the uh, late 50s and early 60s and had read some of the documents that Paul Barron had written um, talking about packet switching. And uh, then when I left Bell Laboratories to go to RAND, the RAND Corporation, I actually worked with Paul and continued to be interested in it. I then went uh, down to the University of California at Irvine as an academic and uh, actually uh, got involved with it in two ways. One, students were interested in, and I was interested in, and, and a good friend of mine from many years ago, uh, uh, Bob Kahn, was working at DARPA and was leading that project. So, oh, when by the time it was done, I ended up with a small research project looking at how to secure certain aspects of the ARPANET and one of the, the relay machines, the IMPs, there. Uh, my students there uh, included a student from uh, University of California at Los Angeles, which was John Postel. So I got, uh, he was my gra graduate student, so I ended up, we were working on a thesis on network reliability and network performance. But that got me introductions and uh, to other students, Steve Crocker, Vint Cerf, et cetera. So I, I started getting more and more involved. Also at Irvine, we were creating probably the world's first real operational distributed system. And we were using a, a fairly novel uh, local network called the token ring and developing many of the techniques that are now being used in the cloud services. So that's actually what I'm getting my funny little award for, among other things. Uh, a number of my students are down there, like Paul Mark Petrus went on into the thing. So in some sense, my academic children became some of the, grand, the fathers of the internet. That's why some people mumble them, the grandfather of the internet. Oh, well, that's fine. You know, being a father is a pain in the neck. Uh, uh, being a grandfather is great. <laughs> Believe me, I've done it. Um, I then went to, after um, staying in LA for a while, I went to um, University of Delaware, go back east where I was from originally, and again got in, got involved in some of the early network stuff with students, uh, some of them, Dave Sinkowski and others, went on to do significant work in that area. But what, what I did along with uh, some of my colleagues around the country is we noticed that uh, this was doing the post-Sputnik era and suddenly technology was everything. And there were little computer science departments in almost every university around the world and uh, especially around the United States, and all of them were small. And we realized that that wasn't going to work for long because they had nobody to talk to. So we proposed, f uh, actually f three of us, proposed to the National Science Foundation that they fund an experiment in creating a network using basically internet technology, but also using telephones, whatever we get our hands on, to allow uh, universities, computer science departments, to talk to each other through email. And uh, we got money to do that, uh, created the server environments we needed. We were using first ARPANET technology, but uh, we also established interconnects between this CSNet and the ARPANET, which had some of the big schools on it, and we also extended it to industrial research laboratories. So pretty soon we had a web of, of largely computer science people who were counting on that. Uh, we then wrote a couple papers for science and made some proposals and extended it to universities as a whole, everybody in the university, and went on from there. <laughs> It grew uh, almost out of control at that point. Uh, so I, uh, I was uh, PI in some, uh, almost all of those activities. I chaired the uh, National Science Foundation Advisory Board on Networking, 
you know, once you get in that mess, you, you stay in that mess. So that's, that's how I got into it, largely. Some of the breakthrough moments were the establishment early on on an intertie between the op and that, the military experiments, they were on military networks, and this CS net. That involved basically making an agreement with the government to allow us to pass traffic back and forth and establish the notions of peering relationships that are now standard. So that was done. We also, uh, looking at another one, we established a uh, uh, acceptable use policy, which I live to regret, but I wrote the first one. Uh, and that said, what could run on that net? What could it be used for? And rather than making a very constricted one, we tried to make it as liberal as possible. And that meant a lot of people could use it. They didn't have to only do computer science. Uh, that was one. Also, the establishment of uh, interconnect agreements with foreign. We, we were John, Johnny Appleseeds. We'd walk around with a tape to Japan. We'd find some bright graduate student there, and he'd bring up that software. And then we had an agreement with them to, that we could intertie with them. And so that, those mechanisms, which we propagated to almost every country in the world, I think were the beginning of the idea that the internet, well, wasn't the internet at that point, that the net was a global phenomenon, not subject to censorship, not subject to paying for it. You, you provide your own facilities. We were there to accept your mail and deliver mail and other things. And then, uh, that was one big thing. And then uh, working with the NSF to privatize some of the networks. Because originally they were networks designed for research, academic t things. And it was much more than that. And putting into place the mechanisms which allowed anybody to use it, I think, was a, a very key point. And then all the you know, controlling the growth and everything. Uh, I think once you got to that point, it was unstoppable. I think it stole me for a number of reasons. Um, I think uh, privacy, security are uh, major problems. And it's going to create many a storm. And you see, you've seen some of them over the last month or two with the Snowden thing. But that's a small part. Governments have caught on to the fact that the internet is um, powerful, it's uncontrollable. Governments don't tend to like to have things that are uncontrollable. So just the, the attempt of government to regulate, to control the internet in an environment where it's almost impossible to do that. You know, a friend of mine put it nicely, he said the internet routes around censorship. You know, it's very difficult to control it, and that, that's going to cause a lot of stress. Countries, and you see that with Europe, are trying to say, ah, we, we now have an excuse to say, we want to forbid U.S. companies from operating here because we don't trust them. That type of, of balkanization, I think, could destroy the utility of that. Uh, the other things, I think, that are, are somewhat are very dangerous is the fact that Governments, and they've they're always been doing it, want to know everything about what you're communicating with and who you're communicating with. And that, I think, is going to cause a lot of problems. Some of them will take a while to develop, but uh, people are beginning not to trust. You know, and the internet is all about trust. Identity problems on the net are a big problem. You know, there was that famous New Yorker cartoon that says, with a dog on a computer saying on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Well, nobody knows who you are. And that, that creates additional problems. Uh, so I'd, I'd call it stormy in the sense that a lot of policies are being made now by, largely by people who don't understand the net culture or the net technology. And they're making some bad mistakes and, and are going to run into real troubles with it. The other thing is the net is not a reliable beast. It was never built to be uh, stressed the way it's stressed. 
we were trying to see if it could be done. Uh, nobody, it was a small, relatively small group of people. Uh, we trusted each other because we all knew each other. And so issues like security and robustness, robustness was, was engineered, but security you didn't worry about. So you built a set of uh, rules, protocols, which largely ignored security because who's going to, you know. Well, you know, now it's so huge that it resembles society as a whole and you, you have these endless penetrations. And it's, it's not an easy job to fix them. As you, we're sitting here at the IETF been trying for years to fix them. Uh, we could have maybe done it years ago when there were a thousand people on the net, 10,000, but now there are millions and millions and trying to do anything is difficult because it's not just the network, it's the computers you use on it. So uh, I'd call it stormy. I think it's gonna get a little stormier for a while. The other thing that's happening uh, is that technology is changing very fast. And there are limitations in the network that are gonna mean that it's gonna have to be redesigned at some point in the future. And the redesign will be fun but how to ever get it out into the field is not at all obvious. Uh, one of my hopes that becomes a very ubiquitous thing that people can trust, people can use with some assurance that it's, uh, that it will not bite them back, best way to say. When you use the telephone, uh, always able to wiretap a telephone. But there were a set of laws that made it uh, difficult. And in fact, wiretapping a telephone with the technology we had, we could do it, but you know, you, there was no way to process it. Now, courtesy of Google and many others, you can absorb all that, you can analyze it. And so you can find interesting things, like you're talking to him and he talked to him and he talked to us, uh, a bad guy, and therefore, by definition, you suddenly are a bad guy. You know, no, you can't. That's not a logical thing, but it will happen. People will be will be uh, punished for things that uh, they do, and that's dangerous. Uh, my hope is that we can do something about that in the short term, and it's not just technology. It's it's. Uh, it's law, it's convincing uh, lawmakers who naturally don't like that, uh, that their economic health depends on a healthy, open internet. And there are a lot of people around here working on that. ISOC works on it and others. But when you go to Washington, it's not clear that they understand it or any other capital. It depends on the country you're in. Education, education not only of the current leadership, but future leadership. I mean, that's happening uh, in most universities. Something happens, though, as people get older, they maybe get conservative, but they forget what they did as kids, at, as college students, and suddenly they pass laws that, are, you know, that they would be not like if they were, but that, that's the way the world works. I think you have to educate. You have to educate how important the internet has become in the world economy. You know, if you suddenly could stop it, it wouldn't just be inconvenient, it would be a catastrophe. A lot of things wouldn't work. Lights would go off, everything would go pluey. And so it's a, it's a beast that the health of which I think is gonna drive the, the world forward. And without it, I think we will probably spiral now into a, a very bad economic depression, which uh, is not healthy. Uh, I think education of, of people uh, is very, very important. And uh, one of the things, and education of people who will help determine that. For instance, the universities should have introductory courses in some of the social policy issues I mean, technology, they all know how somehow it works, maybe a little bit of that, but more, but more the, the societal issues, how it's used, what its constraints are. And uh, that will help.
but it's going to be a rough time because you know, it's like the buggy, the, the automobile, a lot of old businesses go out of business and we have to make sure we replace them. Uh, and we have to make sure that we don't destroy things. Like we're well on our way of, of making it almost impossible for a whistleblower to contact a reporter. And it's not just, it's, it's, you know, the, we've removed the classic ways of doing it. Mm -hmm. And the internet has taken its place, but people don't like it. So they try to somehow uh, stop it by controlling the net. I think it's very important to uh, educate people out of all um, level, all disciplines over the, let me call it the ethics of the net, uh, the um, what's an acceptable role of government in a private enterprise and what's an acceptable role for citizens. You know, and, and every country has a different, I, I don't think we, we will ever get to the point where there's a uniform thing, but within countries, uh, we should have, we should be educating them what their rights are and what their obligations are, and we don't. <laughs>